like to get started, Adam? Yeah, sure. So thanks for joining today. So just to let you know a little bit about uh, today's uh, webinar. So uh, Tim is going to take you through uh, the UK market as an asset class, like the positives, negatives, and so on and so forth, all those kind of basic things. Also, the kind of price ranges that you might want to um, you know, consider when going into the UK market, because a lot of people think it's just the top end, London and whatever. Uh, also, at the end, there will be a question and answer session. So if you've got something very specific to ask, like let's say you're an expat or somebody living in a country where you assume it's not easy to get a mortgage, but maybe it is easy, all those kind of niche questions you'll be able to ask as well right at the end of uh, the webinar. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, just to get started, guys. So as as Adam correctly mentioned, there will be a bit of a, a format to today's talk. Uh, at the end, there's the opportunity for us to all get together, answer questions, cover off anything else that I may have missed. But for the most part, um, my role today really is just to provide you with an introduction to, first of all, property as an asset. And then secondly, the UK market and the opportunities we have there. So just starting off, um, the, the the big question then, who are we and how do we relate to Adam, his business, his clients? So our company is API Global. We've worked with Adam for over a year now. We're happy to say we've helped many of his clients look into UK property and invest into the UK market. Essentially what we look to do, so with Adam, he has a very a very well general broad focus with his business is able to offer you guys a good amount of investment options different vehicles um, our position with our relationship with adam we're here to act as property specialists so when adam has clients yourselves partners um, circle of connections and friends who are interested in looking into real estate or property as an asset class, we come on board to act essentially as property uh, specialists. So our position in that, um, in that kind of relationship, we're there to essentially provide an end-to-end -end solution. So I'll go into details in a moment and we can kind of look more at the specifics of the market. But in general, our approach really is to package and provide property as if it were any other asset class. And we do that by essentially being your partner throughout the whole process. So starting from that initial side with kind of market research investment advice, all the way through to purchasing the asset, mortgaging the asset, owning and managing the asset, and then eventually selling the property. So our position, which I'll go into in a moment, um, this slide actually helps a lot. It just shows the phases that we're all involved with. Essentially, we're there to make real estate an easy to understand and easy to own and manage asset class. My position, so I'm based in Asia. I've been working directly with Adam's clients for over a year now. I'm essentially here as an advisor to you. Um, I'm also on the other side of the business there when it comes to finding the correct property and the correct route to market. But essentially, my role is to act almost as a consultant. So looking at what your goals are, be it financial or long term, I'm there to kind of lend assistance and show how property can step in as the suitable option for you. So this is this is something that I'll come on to in a moment, but it, it's just a good starting point. Essentially, a lot of people will be asking at this stage, why use someone like API? Um, how can Adam and his relationship benefit us? A big part of what we do is research led. So for anyone who's looked at the property market, be it in their own country, in the UK or investing, there's a huge, huge amount of options. And as with many of these things, the more choice you have, the more complicated things get. We're there essentially to take an institutional investor's approach and provide you with the easiest solution when it comes to looking at the markets. Um, that's basically one of the big benefits of working with ourselves. Um, we're there to make things simple, provide a bit of an investment case to the options and then essentially just give you very easy to understand properties that you can invest into.
So starting off, just to kind of start quite generally, um, I'm conscious we have quite a few different people on the on the meeting today on the call. Um, there'll be different levels of experience ranging from completely green, no kind of experience with property in the past, through to those of you who own your own homes in different countries or your current country as an expat and those of you who already have an investment portfolio. So what I like to do really is just provide context at each level. And this is a really important one. So I guess by your presence on the call today, there is at least some interest in the property market or there's a need to kind of understand a little bit more about real estate. And that's how I like to start really, just providing a bit of insight as to why it's such a good asset class to be focusing on. Um, you can see here, we've got a few points on the screen. When it compares against a lot of other asset classes, when you look at things like stocks, bonds, savings plans, um, futures, options, contracts, all of that kind of the finance investment side that can be simple through to very confusing, property stands out a lot of the time as a known tangible asset class. At the end of the day, you're investing into an underlying asset, so you're purchasing a property you've got that tangible asset that provides its own versatility. It's somewhere you can use yourself and all, and with yourselves being overseas or away from the actual asset itself, it's good to know that it's there. You can go and view it. You can knock on the door and you can enter the property. It's a very versatile class as well. So it provides two forms of return. Um, so your investment return comes from things like your yield, which is your annual rental return. So from renting out the property you own each year, it's the passive income that you get from the tenant being in that property. Uh, you also have capital growth, which is arguably the larger one. That's the property price growth. And that's one of the reasons we focus on the UK market, because it is such a strong, stable, consistently growing market. As well, a big thing for a lot of us today, and one thing that I think we'll probably spend a lot of our Q&A session talking about, it's the mortgage side. So you're able to leverage property. You can lend up to 75% of the property value. Um, and that's a real big factor for those of us who are looking at building wealth. You can own an asset that's worth X amount simply by contributing 25% in actual capital invested, which is big news and something we'll look at shortly. Again, just looking at it in general. So it's, it's a stable part of your portfolio. So for those of you who already have investments, property is a really good cornerstone to have in your portfolio. It's a low risk asset and it's also a really good hedge against inflation. So next question, the thing that we look at, at the points I mentioned, you could argue apply universally um, around the globe when it comes to different markets. What we want to focus on today is why the UK in particular. I'll get into a bit more detail on this, but just to kind of provide some fast facts. It is a very well known, long established market. Um, UK land and common law has formed the basis for property law in many other Western and developing economies. Um, real institution in the UK with the housing market as well. It's incredibly stable. Um, and we've got data that proves that, which we'll look at in a moment. Importantly, as with any other asset, you want safe, predictable and growing. There are three key words. Risk is always attractive because it provides you with that upside. But when you're in a position where you can adopt a safer, um, more predictable growth pattern, there's always a benefit to it. As mentioned just before, so lending options, that's big news. When we look at a property price, let's say X amount being £200,000, to purchase that property, you will only need to actually provide 25 to 30% of the property price. So for £200,000 property, that means you can own that asset with as little as £50,000 or £70,000 um, USD or €65,000. So big news there as well. The story as well. So just aside from the general route with the UK, it's important to understand the opportunity there and what's actually happening in the market. Um, with a lot of us being international from different countries, different backgrounds, um, we need to have a point that attracts us to the UK. And that's something that I will talk on in a moment. Um, very, very big marketing factor. And again, looking at any kind of market, things like undersupply, chronic demand, they're very important too. 
So this is a graph that I always like to use. Um, excuse me, always like to use when I'm talking about the UK um, with with new clients. This is a really strong tool illustrating what I spoke about um, shortly. Uh, sorry, a, a short while ago. When you look at that stable, reliable, consistent growth, this shows the average house price in the UK over the last 70 years. Um, the important takeaway here: the UK is very cyclical. Um, this graph in particular highlights that very well. It also shows the resilience of the market. We're looking at an average cycle of 10 to 15 years for the UK property prices to double. That's very big news as an investor. So this provides a lot of confidence. Of course, we always say past performance is not always a, a great indicator of future performance. But in these kind of instances, when you look at a stable market, it really is. Um, here, this illustrates how the average property price is doubled every 10 to 15 years. Um, and one of the reasons I also bring up this graph, it's to show just how resilient the property sector is. We look at a few key kind of troughs here. You're looking at the Wall Street crash in 91, and again, the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, the important thing is when you look at that 10, 15 year cycle, that continued despite these major economic downturns. And again, this is another reason that people look towards property as a really strong investment asset. It's because it's a fundamental need. People need housing. They need accommodation. Um, and because of that intrinsic requirement across all levels and classes, property tends to wear economic downturn incredibly well. And looking again, just at simple market factors. So um, a lot of people will ask if the UK is an established market, why would I look at it? Is it not better to look at emerging markets? I know when it comes to investing into stocks and companies, there's a very big allure with that emerging sector, especially emerging market when it comes to foreign exchange or companies. Um, that being said, there's a, there's a lot of change going on in the UK. Um, and it's arguable that there are actually emerging markets within the UK um, itself. And that's the thing we'll look at in a moment. But essentially, there's a very strong supply and demand imbalance within the UK. Um, that, of course, is a major factor when we look at that long term growth. It ensures that those property prices are consistently rising. Um, and you can see here from this 10, 15 year historic map, um, the amount of housing required has always stayed relatively similar with growth in steady stages. However, the supply of housing um, very rarely meets the demand. And one thing that we're able to kind of look at now, it's where the demand is the strongest. So looking at just a few factors that are pushing this, um, as with many developed economies, average household sizes are decreasing. So gone are the days where people have three, four, five, six children, and they all live together. Nowadays, demographic or current demographic dictates that we're looking at one or two children. Once they reach 18, 20, 21, um, they're graduated or they're ready and in the working environment. And for the most part, people actually look to live on their own. So that's what causes this spread. Um, looking at lifestyle factors as well. So um, a big demand for kind of, especially amongst the young, um, more kind of built up areas, social influence, they want access to kind of trendier living quarters. And that's dictating where the gaze is really when it comes to the house pricing growth. Availability of land as well. As with all, all countries now, there's a tendency for people to flock towards cities. Cities offer better living conditions, better pay, better opportunity. Um, much more interesting locations for people to live, especially if they're within a certain age demographic. And that basically concentrates the, the, the kind of the gaze of where people are wanting to live. And of course, that creates a finite supply of land, um, which again increases pricing, which is good for us. Um, moving on. So just to, to kind of before I get into the actual UK market itself and we examine that together. I want to just look at what's been happening the last few years. Um, in particular, it's important to acknowledge COVID-19 and what's happened over the last two or three years. If we look at the economy in general, nationally um, and internationally, there has been some downturn. One important thing to mention with the UK, um, there's a lot to be said about how the government handled COVID. 
Um, however, they did a fantastic job of managing the housing market. They provided tax incentives, support for first time buyers, support for foreign buyers and investors. And because of that, the UK housing market not only stayed um, at a consistent level, it actually grew over the last two years, which is very big news for us looking at investing into the housing sector. Um, the property prices have been performing well, and there's a really big opportunity now in certain parts of the UK. And that's that's basically what I'd like to do next. So um, if you're still with me, this is this is a big part of, of how I kind of approach the UK. Um, one thing I always like to do for the benefit of those who are from England or for those who aren't is just provide a bit of a market update really and show what's happening in the UK. So with the UK, we have a very apparent north south divide. Essentially, this is a big imbalance between northern and southern cities. And if we look at this imaginary line, which runs from just north of Norwich down to South Wales, even those of us who aren't too familiar with the UK, there's already a bit of a discrepancy between the kind of two cities or the two borders, I should say. If you look to the south, you have London, Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, Bath, Brighton, Canterbury, Kent. These are very affluent, very well established cities with high property prices, good education and a lot of opportunity. London being the capital is certainly the anchor for this. And then if you look north of this, the main majority of the UK population is concentrated in the Midlands and the north. Um, and one thing that I always try and just provide a bit of context to is just how much change is happening over the last 10 years. The, the, the kind of seismic shift we're seeing has all been started from a historic trend that, that basically began in the 70s. So as with many economies, there's been a lot of change in what sectors make up the majority of the economy. And to understand what's happening in the UK now, I want to kind of take us back to when that change first started. So back in the 70s and early 80s, major parts of the UK economy came from coal mining, car manufacturing, um, heavy factory work and industrial work. And those sectors of the economy, which were a major part of the UK gross domestic product, were located in the Midlands and the North. Things like car manufacturing, coal mining and heavy industry in particular, they were located in the Midlands and the North. And what happened through uh, basically two main factors, you had Thatcher's Britain. So there was a change in how these industries were viewed, how they were, how the workforce was enabled and what kind of opportunity there was. And importantly, there was a big shift in employment um, in terms of cost of employment. So in the 70s and 80s, over the period of a few years, these important cornerstone industries left the UK. They went in search of cheaper labor, cheaper land, cheaper parts. And a lot of these industries that had been the cornerstone of the Midlands in the North, they essentially disappeared. You were left with high rates of unemployment, a lack of opportunity, um, and basically mass migration started. So people would grow up in these regions, study in these regions in the Midlands and the North. And then there was a strong tendency which predicated over the following decades for people to just migrate south. So that's where areas like London and the surrounding regions started to really benefit. Not only did they have their own populations, but they were now attracting the population in the Midlands and the North. And this created a really strong brain drain effect. Essentially, any kind of in, like imbalance between these two regions only got exacerbated as people who were growing up graduating in these regions, they would head south. And it had a really profound effect on both markets. The southern market grew exponentially and the Midlands and the northern market started to lag behind. They weren't able to reinvent themselves after this legacy of industry left. Um, and basically, that had a really big effect on the UK economy. There was a really big imbalance with London and its surrounding areas vastly outperforming the Midlands, the North and the rest of the UK. 
Um, and for us to kind of summarise what that all meant and why one of, arguably one of the main reasons we continue to focus on the UK, around 10 years ago, the UK government decided to take a very hardline stance on this imbalance. They created something called the levelling up agenda and essentially they made the executive decision to contribute a lot of money, time and effort towards levelling up these regional cities. They focused on areas like Birmingham, the Midlands, Manchester, the North, and they wanted to invest and improve the quality of life, opportunity, education in these regions to a point where they'd actually start to compete with London. For, for reference, the, the amount of time and money they've attributed towards this in, the investment and development plan is incredible. Um, between Birmingham and Manchester, their city centre regeneration plans, they sit at around £25 billion pounds, and they're looking at a 20 year development plan. At this stage, we're halfway through those development plans and essentially the, the cliff notes are they've been hugely successful in raising the status of these cities these regional economies now these regional cities they've exploded over the last 10 years and we've got major milestones over the next 10 15 years that ensure this growth will continue and essentially that's that's a big part of what api look to do um, in coalition with Adam and his clients, we're essentially helping people get strategic access to the fastest growing parts of the UK. And we're looking to basically help people piggyback on these national development plans and strategically place themselves within the property sector into an area that's developing, growing in line with these big plans. And that, that's basically it, to be honest. That's one of the big things that we focus on. It's served us incredibly well over the last 10 years, um, and it helps us understand where the opportunity and the change will be. So starting off, there's essentially on, on this meeting, I'm going to introduce a couple of regions to you. We're going to focus on two properties. But as I've done with many of Adam's clients before, if you are interested in finding out more afterwards, we can talk directly and we can actually have a focus on any particular region or property. For the sake of keeping this relatively short and sweet, I want to just run through two of what I think are our best investment options. So starting off with Birmingham, as mentioned, this is one of the major focuses for the UK's levelling up agenda. The Birmingham itself, it's the second largest city. It's the second most populous city. It has a young demographic, which is important, and it now has the largest finance hub outside of London. And just talking a few, taking a few moments to talk on the actual development plan and one of the reasons Birmingham's such a good location to be looking at, its own development plan, the big city plan, um, focuses on redeveloping the city centre. Just on screen now, we have a few examples of what has been happening over the last 10 years. These are huge amounts of money. It's a massive portion of the government fiscal policy that's being allocated towards these regions. And the reason that I kind of bring these up is just to show how much effort is being put into these plans, what kind of opportunity is, ha is available and essentially the seismic change that we're seeing. So starting with the main train station, a £600 million investment, and then one of the business districts, Paradise Birmingham, half a billion pounds. And currently underway, we have the Smithfield Market, which is a billion pound investment, and importantly, HS2. Now, this is big news. HS2 is the first inland bullet train within the UK. It's the first bullet train they're building, and it's the largest engineering project in the UK since they built the motorways. This HS2 is in, is in place essentially to connect London and Birmingham in a very quick time. The traditional travel time between the two cities is around an hour and 20. When this completes um, in the next five or six years, we're actually looking at a travel time of 45 minutes, which has major implications for business and commuters. So not only is Birmingham improving as a city, it's improving its links to London. So it's basically competing on two fronts as its own separate economy and also as a commuter economy for London. 
Um, again, with Birmingham, it has an important demographic. So it's a major institution for learning. There's three major universities and two medium universities. Birmingham, um, University of Birmingham and Aston University are world leading universities. University of Birmingham is known for economics, medicine and law. Aston is known for business and law as well. So the reason I mention this, um, we don't necessarily cater to students, but graduates form a huge portion of the rental market. If you look at the average UK market, um, it's 34 years old when someone purchases their first property. That is, generally speaking, quite old. And the reason being um, the student fees in the UK are amongst the highest in the world. Students that graduate from these top flight universities, they have to take a lot longer to save enough money for a property deposit. The important news there for us being the vast majority of people under the age of 34 are now reliant on renting a property because they can't afford to buy one. What that means for us as investors, as landlords, as property owners, it's basically important information so we understand what the main demographic is for renting. That 20 to 34 year old group, with them being heavily reliant on renting, that provides us with a very broad portion of the market we can aim at when it comes to owning a property that appeals to them. So when you have these university cities, it's not the students we look at, it's the graduates each year. Looking at this, 75,000 students, a third of those are graduating every year. You're looking at around 25,000 graduates, of which the retention rate is 50%. So every year, that's 10, potentially 10 plus thousand people who are entering the market in Birmingham as workers, and they're all reliant on renting a property. So that gives you some idea as to the scope of the property market there. And on that note, I'd like to introduce, um, I'd like to introduce our first development. Um, we can cover off questions um, at the end as well. I'm just gonna go through this quickly just to provide you a bit of context as to the kind of property we look to offer. Um, but yeah, any questions, feel free to raise your hand at the end. So that being said, my points on Birmingham and the typical demographic, the rental demographic, we basically look to cater to that demographic. So on this, I'd like to just start by introducing the, one of the areas we focus on. Solihull is a very interesting part of Birmingham. It is considered the most affluent part of the city. Um, it's the most desirable to live in as well, which is really important. It's very close to one of the high speed stations. Um, it has a nine minute commute time from Solihull to Birmingham city centre and the business district. So it's an incredibly popular location for commuters, which is very important because that's a big portion of the market that we aim at. Um, and looking at this map, this is really important. So Solihull, um, which is where we look, as mentioned, the train line takes nine minutes to get into the city centre. So door to door for this project, it's about a 14 minute commute to get from your front door to the central business district in Birmingham. One thing I like to mention as well is the future of this region. One of the high speed stations, for reference, there's only going to be four bullet train stations on the HS2 line. Two are in London and one, the third one is here. And the final one is actually in Birmingham city center. The reason I raise that, Solihull is a very interesting location because there's gonna be very quick connectivity to the high speed station. We're talking between three and six minutes, um, either by car, train or bus. And then once you get there, it's only 38 minutes into central London from the station. So not only does Solihull has fantastic access to Birmingham and the main market we're focusing on, it also provides you with access when it completes to London city centre in around 45 minutes, which is huge. For reference, the average commute time for people living in and around London is 62 minutes. This Solihull location will provide you access to London in 45 minutes when it completes. So the future in terms of milestones is very promising because not only do we have Birmingham's growth and development, you also have increasingly quick access to the London market as well. 
And just to kind of run through Solihull in general, it's the home to Jaguar Land Rover. Um, it's where they have their headquarters. Um, because of its size and influence, it has one of the largest local enterprise partnerships, essentially one of the largest um, investment allocations. You can see there almost half a billion pounds um, is attributed to the, to the Solihull growth program that focuses on things like education, transport links, business, quality of life. Um, it's the best location in Birmingham for schooling. It has the highest percentage of outstanding schools. It has some of the best private schools as well. Um, and again, really good access to some of the key parts of Birmingham's business sector. So just to kind of introduce the property itself. So this is a mixture of studio one and two bedroom apartments. Um, all of them come with a private parking space, which is important. This property is basically finishing construction. It will be ready in the next six weeks. Um, and it's a really good investor option. You're in an established market, but you're appealing to people who are commuting to Birmingham. And eventually your market will open up and you'll appeal to people who are commuting to London as well. So it's a really promising market. Um, just to give you a bit of insight, we have the town centre here. Brands like John Lewis, Waitrose are all located there. Um, and our development here comes in three phases. This is the phase that we're focusing on. Um, a really nice collection of spacious studio one and two bedroom apartments. So just to kind of introduce, um, the apartments are really well designed. So we've been in the market now for a decade. We know what kind of properties sell well. And that's basically what governs our approach when it comes to the architecture and internal design. Studio apartments are a great option. You can invest from £58,000. That will be total capital required for reference. Um, one bedrooms are a great option as well. They're a little more expensive. You can see 195,000 for a studio, 215,000 for a one bed. Large sized apartments. Um, these ones, 64,000 pounds is the investment amount required. And then two beds for those of you who are looking at basically owning a larger property. Um, these start from £299,000. They're large properties, so large open plan living area, double private bathroom, large double bedrooms with space for a desk. Um, these will be around £89,000 required to invest. And to, to kind of keep things short and sweet, that's, that's Birmingham. That's one of maybe four options we have in the city, but it's a very good one to introduce. Um, I'd now like to just speak for a few moments on Manchester. Um, this is a really good alternative for us to be looking at. Um, Manchester in particular, as I mentioned earlier, is also the major focus of the UK's levelling up agenda. Um, Manchester and Birmingham are at the forefront of the UK government's policy of competing with London. Both of them have performed fantastically well over the last decade. Um, the change in quality of life, the number of people who have moved there, the number of graduates who have opted to stay there. It's just been a massive success story. And with Manchester, um, similar to Birmingham in terms of pricing and opportunity, geographically it's located in the north of the country, so it's known as the jewel in the north. Essentially, it's the capital in the north. You have cities like Liverpool, Leeds, Sheffield, Hull and York around it, which are all major economies as well but Manchester sits at the centre. And to, to kind of give you a quick introduction with Manchester, it's known as a split city. So there's two major economic quarters. You have the central business district here and the traditional city centre. And then to the west, you have Media City UK. Now, one of the things that Manchester did very well at the start of its development program, it carved out a niche for itself as the hub for telecommunications, broadcasting and media. And one such way it did that, um, BBC actually relocated from London to Manchester. And this area here is known as BBC Docklands. It's their headquarters. They film here, they present here, they um, do all of their kind of core business effort here. And then next door you have ITV, which is the 
third largest television and media company in the UK. They're also located here. And then IWM North, which is a northern focused um, telecommunications and broadcasting company. Essentially, the, the story here being most people who are working in Manchester will be working either here in the central business district or here in Media City. And so with that, that kind of dictates our approach to the market. Um, Urban Green is the development that I'd like to introduce us next. And just to provide some context to it, this is where it's located. So on the map, we're located here. And importantly, it's equidistant between both sectors of the um, of the city's economy. To the cent to the south south I'm um, sorry to the northeast, you have the central business district. Huge brands like Google, Amazon, and PricewaterhouseCoopers located here. And then, as mentioned, you have Media City with a couple of other companies like Bupa and Ericsson there. Now, the reason we've located here, um, if you look at the land use map, this is an incredibly popular place for residential. Um, there's a lot of kind of outdoor amenities, very good shopping, but importantly, there's a very good metro link. So that's this yellow station here. This connects you to the central business district in six minutes via an overground train, which runs every five to 10 minutes. And it also connects you to Media City in around 12 minutes. So with our location here, the city centre is now very expensive, given the amount of companies and demand for living there. What we've opted to do is choose a more investor friendly route. So we look at an area that has fantastic connectivity, high quality of life, but importantly, it comes in at a much lower price point. So properties in this region are on average 25% cheaper than they are in the city centre. But given the Metro link, they have the exact same commute time for someone who's living in the city and walking into the actual business district. So with this one, this one is currently under construction, um, Urban Green Manchester. You can see with its location, there's Sky Gardens. So these are communal gardens which face towards the central business district. You can see um, that located here. The apartments are designed again with the end user in mind. So we're looking at providing a very good quality property for yourselves, but importantly, a property that will perform well on the rental market. By, its by virtue of its location, um, it appeals to a much wider portion of the market. It's a lot more affordable. Um, you can see from design, it still provides a really high end fit out. So you've got floor to ceiling windows. The majority of the apartments face towards the city, which is gonna be really big when you look at reselling. Um, and you've also got a co-working lounge private co-working lounge in the building as well. So with things like COVID and flexible working hours, we're looking to cater towards that working sector that will be living in this area. It's a really, really interesting proposition from my perspective. I've worked in both the Birmingham and Manchester market for the last five years. Um, and this kind of property is exactly what I like to work on personally. You're purchasing a really strong part of the market, but you're not paying that premium for being located in the middle of the city center. And looking at this, my pick would be two bedroom properties. Because it's off plan, so because it's being constructed, the amount of capital you have to invest to legally purchase the property is a lot lower. That's one of the benefits of off plan. You can see here, you can actually purchase a high floor two bedroom property um, cost 245,000. But the important bit here, the in total investment amount is 55,000 pounds, which is really important. Um, and this is just an example. You can see one of the apartments here. So this is a two bedroom on the seventh floor, 245,000 pounds. Um, really interesting option. Because of the two bedroom, two bathroom nature, this will perform really well on resale. People are looking for that extra bathroom, so it's a good market factor. And this is what a lot of the properties that I would recommend in this development look like. You're accessing the two bed market, so you can appeal to a couple, two young professionals, or just people who want more space. And then when it comes to reselling the property, because it's a two bedroom, it's a larger property, it appeals to a few more, uh, sorry, a larger portion of the market. So really interesting option to be looking at for us. 
and I'll, I'll just skip past this. It just talks on the growth and development of Manchester. Essentially, this area here, which I mentioned, this is one of the next locations for the for Manchester's um, Manchester's big city plan, basically. So the government is contributing a lot of money towards redeveloping this area as well. Just to take us to the closing statements. So, of course, we can go over specific questions in a moment, but what I'd like to do is just let you know the typical process. So with these projects, with these properties, um, generally speaking, you can lend up to 75% of the property property value through a loan or through a mortgage. And the payment terms as such, you're looking at it's £5,000 to reserve the apartment. That's part of the purchase price. And then you exchange. So the cash deposit required is either 20 or 25% typically. And then the remaining value is due when the property completes or when your mortgage is ready. On the mortgage note, I will I will focus on this in the Q and A. But as mentioned before, loan va loan value is up to seventy five percent. Importantly, there's no requirement for a British passport. Personally, with my business being located in Asia and covering Asia and the Middle East, eighty percent of my clients aren't British, and it's never an issue for mortgaging. UK banks and international banks are very keen on lending to international financially mobile investors, and that benefits everyone quite well. We can purchase through your personal name or through a company name. And essentially, there's a lot of different options with the mortgage we take. So generally speaking, you'd be surprised in just how hospitable um, the mortgage market is. Again, I won't focus on this too much, but we have a fully comprehensive service. We can assist with managing and the upkeep of the property as well. But these are things that we can focus on should we talk one on one just there to let you know that it is a full end to end solution. So every kind of issue or requirement or task you'll encounter, either myself or one of my team members will be there to assist you. So I'll, um, I'll stop there. Hopefully all of you managed to keep up with that. Been talking for a good 40 minutes. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions. I'm sure Adam has a few as well. Um, but if you'd like to just basically raise your hand or write in the chat, um, I'll ask Adam or Swen to just read out any questions as they come. Yeah, uh, one question I've had actually, Tim, before the webinar is, you know, a lot of expats, well, not a lot, but uh, some expats do actually still have UK PLC companies, not just British people, but are expats. Um, and obviously some people also, not as many people, but have like trusts, for example, UK trusts or uh, offshore trusts. Um, and a lot of people have heard, of course, that it can be tax advantageous to buy through a PLC company potentially. What's your feelings about buying UK property through a trust or a company structure, like a UK PLC company structure? Perfect. So really good question to be asking. Um, with, with all of us being located overseas, tax is a big consideration. Um, and part of my role, a lot of what Adam will ask of me as well, is that I ensure any kind of purchase or transaction we make is the most tax efficient possible. So with that, essentially, it will come down to the individual clients. Um, mortgages and banks view different people differently, but essentially they are very hospitable. And when it comes to a company structure versus a personal structure, um, the company structure has a lot of tax benefits. I normally recommend a company structure if you're not British because it affords you a lot of the tax benefits that British expats will have simply by holding that British passport. They're both very equally matched. Essentially, what it comes down to is we'll look at the mortgage rate. So if the mortgage rate is better for a personal name, over a company structure, that's a conversation we can have. If they're relatively similar, then the company structure is something that I'd recommend. But again, we'll do that on a base, a case to case basis. But it, it's a good option to have and one that has helped a lot of people save a good amount of money. Yeah, thanks, Tim. 
OK, um, I'll leave my screen shared. Adam or Sven, if there's any other questions that pop up, um, do let me know. Um, as, as well, for people that are on the call today, if you'd like to share your experience of property or if you'd just like to give a bit of information on your background, say which country you're from, um, I can always provide my insight onto what it looks like investing from that place. Um, generally speaking, the mortgages are very hospitable. It's never really a case of you won't have a mortgage option. It's more of a case of how many options you have. Certain countries are viewed a bit more favorably by banks, but for the most part, all countries will have an option. Just stop, stop my share for a moment. Um, let me obviously just get that back up. Um, Adam, any anything else that's that's kind of popped up in your dealings with your clients that, that I guess you could qualify as a frequently asked question? Well, uh, I think the mortgage question gets asked a lot. A lot of people assume if they're in a developing country or poor country, it's harder to get a mortgage. It might be a bit harder, but you know, I think we've yeah, you know, the last person we helped was um, you know. Uh, in Central Africa, and it was fine, right, to get the, the mortgage. Um, I think another thing is the typical size of the deposit and also how much the interest rates are approximately. I think those two things come up quite a lot. Obviously, it always varies, right, but just the like, typical basics on that. Perfect, yeah. Well, again, good. Good question to ask. So hopefully, as you saw on my presentation, the important thing is there's a range of investment options when it comes to price point. Um, generally, I say as a golden rule of thumb, the minimum amount to cover all of your associated costs, we're looking at around 50 to 55,000 um, pounds, which sits around the 70,000 US dollar and above mark. Um, apologies if you're working in another currency, um, but th they're the two that we look to focus on. So you're looking at that kind of investment amount, £50,000 and above. Um, how it works with the interest rates. So again, the interest rates will depend slightly on personal circumstances. For the most part, in 99% of my dealings, the goal is that the property rental price will always cover your mortgage and any other associated costs. So, for example, your monthly mortgage, um, it's always covered by the tenant who is renting it. We do a lot of due diligence and research to ensure that the markets that we're working in are buoyant and stable enough to cover any associated costs, including the mortgage. And basically what we look to do is, is ensure you're net neutral. So you purchase the asset, you contribute your £55,000. And the idea is in 99% of cases, you'll never have to put another penny or cent into that investment. It will sit there. The mortgage will get paid each month by the tenant. And then essentially the mortgage amount decreases every year as your tenant chips away and the property price value increases every year in line with the market. So essentially, you're looking at a position where your net monthly income increases each year as rental prices increase and also as your mortgage amount decreases. And then the big picture, as mentioned earlier, is that capital appreciation. So at the same time, your property price is increasing each year. The markets that we work in, so Manchester and Birmingham, for example, they're not our only markets, but they're two of our key markets. You're looking at an average capital appreciation of around between four and 6% each year. Historically, over the last half decade, both cities have outperformed that. But to be a bit more realistic, you're looking at around a 5% property price increase. What I've said and, and those numbers, they kind of dictate what you'd expect. The longer you hold the asset, the better it performs. With the UK, as I mentioned as well, you're looking at a 10 to 15 year cycle for the average property price to double. And that's really where the leverage model starts to turn a lot of heads. Um, if you can hold that property for 12, 15 years, Generally speaking, the property is doubled in value, but the amount that you've contributed towards that investment always stays the same. So initially, you're looking at, say, a £200,000 property. 
a £50,000 investment over 15 years, that doubles, but your capital investment always stays the same. So when you come to exit the property and sell it, your £50,000 investment is now worth anywhere up to £400,000 from 40, sorry, from 12, from 12 to 15 years later. And that really, to just kind of drive it home, that's a big reason that people look at property. It's an asset you can invest in, you can leave it there as a cornerstone of your portfolio, and then 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you're in a position where you've got a massive lump sum asset, and you can do with that what you will. A lot of people, once they've paid off the mortgage, they choose to just have that property there to provide them with a with a monthly income. Others choose to sell the property, draw down, and you've now got, now got a big pension fund that you can do with uh, do what you what you wish with. Um, I think I think we we've covered a good amount. Um, I'm conscious I've spoken at all of you for a long time, so feel free to follow up with Adam afterwards if there's any questions or any points that you'd like recovered. We have recorded this presentation. So for those of you that have just joined recently or for those of you who I, who I guess aren't here and aren't listening to me, um, we can get a recording out to you as well. Um, but generally speaking, the next steps are whatever you'd like them to be. Um, ideally, the best way of kind of proceeding is to schedule a call with Adam and myself and we can give a bit more of a tailored approach to the investing side. Um, alternatively, for those of you who are still a bit on the fence, feel free to reach out to Adam with your questions or information you need. We can converse over email um, and proceed that way. Um, any anything else you'd like to add, Adam, or any closing statements before we before we part ways? Uh, no, uh, not really, Tim. Just uh, exactly what you said just then. Um, if you've got any questions, you can contact me directly as well. Uh, thanks for joining, and uh, obviously for the people who are seeing this recording as well, the same thing uh, as well. You can reach out to me or Tim. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time, everyone. Um, look forward to speaking with you all individually, and I yeah, hope you all have a good afternoon, morning, evening, depending on.